Well, Happy New Year, Tim. 2019. 2019. You know, what a difference a year makes. I remember last year when Kevin Hart was, was, <laughs> was blew up and was on the outs and hosting Academy Awards. And here we are, a year later, <laughs> and it looks like Kevin Hart's going to host, host the Academy Awards again. What it's a difference a, a year it's makes. A, it's or, a funny place. Or about a, a week place. and a half. It's a funny place. Um, it's a funny place. Did, you, did you follow this story? I mean, Not that closely, it's, but, it's, you know. It's absolutely... <laughs> Amazing, uh, and I had a feeling something like this might happen, but I didn't actually think that it was that likely. So apparently, Ellen DeGeneres went to bat for Kevin Hart. Okay, and um, Ellen, uh, and and this by now, by the time this show runs, her her hour long interview with him on her show will will have aired, which was smart for her show, mm. but also for her rep and for the Academy. I mean, like she she genuinely realized that there was a breach. So she stepped in and went and she talked to Kevin. She knows Kevin, you know, they're stand ups. Mm-hmm. She knows his heart. Um, she's a gay woman. She, she, she knows he's, he's not. Which, he, he, which matters. Which matters. <laughs> and uh, so she figured she's the person who can sort of bridge this divide. There's a miscommunication. And she went to the academy and said, um, Would you still be interested in having Kevin? And they said, oh, yes, of course. I mean, we, did we handle it badly? Like, apparently there was just all <laughs> kinds of, you know, we didn't, it was there miscommunication? We didn't mean to offend him or anything. Like, clearly they mm. were just apoplectic about how this whole thing, like, blew up. And uh, so now, uh, as of this recording, Kevin is reconsidering. He's reconsidering. It's, it's, it's interesting that I the ball is in his court. Yeah, uh, because you know, per- perceptually, the ball, else, the ball man. was in the ball was in uh, the academy's court. Well, uh, you know, I mean, other than Ellen, and 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 they've got nobody else. And the other thing is, because of the Kevin Hart situation, and and it, whether or not he did this intentionally and played it right, I don't know. But but um, anybody else picks it up right now, that means you're sloppy seconds. Yeah. You were you were second yeah. you were you were after Kevin Hart. Yeah. Well, there's there's no comedian worth their salt who's going to do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because so they're all friends right. of his. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's it's so. it's, a, it's, a, it's a strange and bizarre situation. Of course, the Golden Globes. I, as we record this, the yeah. Golden Globes will be what Sunday. Yes. This coming Sunday. Yes. And Andy Samberg and uh, Sandra Oh. Yeah. And and, and it is it is funny to me it is funny to me that that organization. You know, the one that we consider to be somewhat less reputable. Yeah. Which we we, we need to cut that out because, you know what, it's over. Um, uh, it, it, <laughs> We're all disreputable. Yeah. With, I mean, who, who's, who's reputable? Is this a reputable person someplace? Yeah. Um, they haven't had any problems at all, at all along no. these lines. None. None. They're doing fine. But the Academy is just jacking it up left and right every year, every year, every year. It's... It is true. I mean, the, the Golden Globes have seen some some slump in their ratings. Um, but, all, all of these things have. But uh, I think maybe the difference is this. The Golden Globes are run by the Hollywood Foreign Press, which is a lot like our organization, LAFCA. Yeah, about except, 90, 100 some odd except, critics. Yeah, it's about the same number of people, except uh, they have a TV show that makes millions of dollars. <laughs> and yeah. we don't. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, which is interesting, and uh, the Academy, on the other hand, is an organization of about what are they up to? About eight, nine, ten thousand people now. Yeah, it, it, and uh, 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 industry professionals, not not journalists. And they have a lot of expenditures over the years. They oh, they have film programs, they have scholarships, they have the uh, student film program. They've got. Uh, giant buildings and a library and archives to maintain and mm-hmm. salaries to pay. I mean, you know, the Academy has a has a, a billion dollar museum they're finishing up right now. Yeah, over on Wilshire. Yeah. Uh, so there's a there's a lot in uh, there's a lot that hinges on the ratings of their show. Whereas the Golden Globes figure, you know, if the show makes us twenty million or thirty million. That's you know what we, we're a nonprofit. We, we'll just uh, just more for somebody. Well, well yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and, and therein lies the problem with the gold yeah. globe. Sometimes yeah. there was a while there. Well, they even got kicked off the air yeah. for a while because it looked like it looked like the situation was if you showed up to the Golden Globes, they'd give you a Golden Globe. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and um, and it was a little shady. They cleaned they cleaned up their act though, and I think that we need to acknowledge that probably for the last fifteen years or so, you know they True. they have a they have True. a proper accounting for, firm. They do all of the things that the academy does um but you know that sort of and, and they're pretty old too i mean the, the the academy is what some not 90 odd years old uh the uh, academy was formed in well the first academy awards were 1927 so i want to say that we were they were formed about 26 okay so 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 uh, so, so so clocking 
Uh, and uh, the Golden Globes were formed in the, what, the 50s? Late well, 50s? No, they're a little older than that. I think they're about 70, 75 years old. Yeah, so 40s. So probably. in the 40s. Yeah. So they, they came in right behind the Academy yeah. Awards as, yeah. as, as, a, as a quick one. And, but, you know, anyway, it's yeah. a funny thing. It's a funny thing. We'll, you'll see. Kevin Hart, right. he'll yeah. be a good host. I, I, I really hope it happens. Kevin has always been a really, really good guy. And, what I would uh, love for him to do. And we is saw to him a, in The Upside, which oh, is yeah. opening soon, too. Opening, which, where, uh, you know? yeah, I'll be on the show next Friday. Yeah. Uh, they'll, yeah. they'll be one of, the ones, one of the ones I have to talk about. Uh, what I, if, if he does, in fact, ultimately host, yeah. I hope that he comes right out and, just, and just, just walks right into it. Oh, he will. He will. I hope he's surrounded by 75 gay dancers. <laughs> <laughs> and I hope he does a Busby Berkeley style. You know, uh, honestly, I have not been this excited. Uh, and, and if it, in fact, is Kevin Hart, I have not been this excited about a host since Billy Crystal's early days. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know. I, this, uh, it just, it feels to me, and I, I make no apologies. I'm a huge he- Kevin Hart fan. Have been for years uh, ever since he was before he was anybody, I remember he was on a uh, a Subaru car commercial <laughs> where where this. he was driving. Oh, dude, this is like twenty years ago. He was on a Subaru car commercial, and uh, it, it, it was it was you know like, hey, drive this Subaru off four wheel drive. And next thing you know, here he is behind the wheel and plowing over <laughs> rocks and yucca trees, going whoa. And next thing you know, he's going hey. And he's loving it, and he's having a great old time in the Subaru. And then, it, I mean, it's a 30-second spot, and then it ends, and he does this little dance at the end, this crazy little dance. And I, and you look, and I remember thinking, okay, that guy makes me laugh. Yeah. I don't know who he is, but he makes me laugh. Soon, he suddenly, he's doing stand-up little and stand-up, some attention, and, you know. and I knew the name. And then he's on The Tonight Show, and, you know, so it all kind of built, but... He's a he's a self made man. He came from a really really rough part of Philadelphia, yeah, yeah. and uh, really tough upbringing. And I, uh, you know, he's he's got a Twitter following that is like nobody's business, and he makes money off it. Yeah, yeah. You gotta be you gotta be really impressed with these with these guys. Yeah, him. Will Smith is another one. Yeah. You know, who who take it and figure it out, and they use the one thing to they get do. the next thing to get the next thing. Uh, they don't stop the, with the one thing. That never. was a mistake back in never. the day. Yeah, uh, when a rapper, you know, a rapper was a rapper, and they just rapped, and then it occurred to some rappers, you know what? A million people know me, and I think I can act. Kevin Hart sells access to his Twitter feed. When he makes a movie, you know you <laughs> I did not, did not know, know this. this. Yeah, because he has something like, I mean, it's ridiculous. I don't know, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50, I don't know how many millions of Twitter followers, but it's an enormous Twitter following. And so when he makes a movie, um, part of the contract is I'll promote the movie, but you're going to pay me like you pay CBS or ABC mm-hmm. or any other network. Mm-hmm. My my Twitter following reaches mm-hmm. more people than mm-hmm. some TV shows. So to reach them, that now I'm now I'm not just the guy in your movie. I'm I'm another thing. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm a marketing. I'm, I'm, I'm a part of the advertising uh, That's uh, apparatus. Literally, That's it. like my existence. Whereas uh, you know, sure, a lot of stars are. What do they call? Uh, um, what's the word for it? They are. Um, it's not trendsetters. There's a there's a certain word. Oh for yeah, it. They, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, you know, people pay them influencers. To, influencers, that's, that's it. If you're an influencer, so yeah. you'll make a little bit of money to, you know, uh, do a snap, do a do a an info, uh, an Instagram of yourself holding like a bar of toothpaste or of soap or yeah. a toothpaste or something, right? Yeah. It's like, oh look, I'm Kim Kardashian and I use Crest and ching. So, but that's not what he's doing. He is he's stepped it up above that. Yeah, it is. If I'm making your movie and you're going to use me. You're also going to now regard my Twitter feed as a separate thing, and you're going to pay me. And he makes millions. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, Kevin Hart makes twenty, thirty million dollars a year off of various things. It's really impressive. And they're perfectly happy to pay him because uh, rather than buying an X number spot on a radio station, for yeah. instance, and you hope that 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 radio ad for the movie hits yeah. X number of correct ears, yeah. the ears that are the appropriate yep. audience for you. It, it, you give Kevin Hart the money, and you know. That everyone, you know exactly how many people are going to see his Twitter my, feed. My last Kevin Hart thing. Did you see the photo that Dwayne Johnson tweeted? No. Oh, my gosh. It's so funny. <laughs> Dwayne Johnson tweeted a photo of himself standing with Shaq and Charles Barkley, mm. who tower over him, mm. by the way. Mm. Now, Dwayne Johnson's a big dude, but Shaq and Charles Barkley are bigger. Yeah, yeah. We're 6, and, 10, and 7, and 5. It, and he looks puny next to them. Puny. And then, and then in the tweet said, now I know how Kevin Hart feels. <laughs> yeah. So, oh, that's anyway, very funny. Empathy is a wonderful thing. 
All right. Well, you know, it's uh, and we've lost a few people. Uh, lost, uh, you know, uh, Daryl Dragon, the the captain from Captain and Tennille. Mm. And we've we've had a, had a few nasty celebrity deaths lately, and we don't want to dwell on those because they'll show up in the in the montages. It's a new year. I do want to say uh, I I had given up on watching the Rose Parade for years and years and years, mm. but my second year of watching Cord and Tish <laughs> is so much fun. Uh, uh, Will Ferrell and, uh, and I, I don't know why Netflix let him go because they went on Netflix last year. Now it's on Funny or Die, which yeah. which Will Ferrell is a co owner of. Oh, so, yeah, so smart. So, that so might be why though. That could be. I'm um, just surprised the contract didn't didn't you know outline them for several years. But uh, that is just so damn funny. And and my wife hates it. She thinks it's so stupid. She says, it's not funny. They're trying too hard. They're trying to be funny. It's not funny. And I'm just sitting there in tears. because they, they did, did you watch it? Oh, yeah. The shtick with, with Tim Meadows yes, and back ridiculous. and forth. And then Tim Meadows is always eating a sandwich. It was and then so he's just, good to see yeah, Tim Meadows. Yeah, I'm going to leave early. I'm going to go uh, down. I'm, you know, I, I'm getting an award at the lodge. I did, it's just so damn funny. I love uh, everything about it. Yeah, And it's almost all improvised. Will Ferrell's uh, Fear of Horses. It's just the best thing in the world. Uh, so anyway, I'm going to start off. I'm going to hit a bunch of anime here real quickly. All righty. Because we have uh, stuff just piled up over the end of the year, and there's a lot of stuff you need to know about. Uh, Witch Hunter Robin, the complete series. Uh, this is actually really, really fun, super well animated, and not so complicated that uh, I can't uh, really understand what's going on, which is very often a problem with anime for me. Is like I, You walk into these universes, and there's just all kinds of stuff going on. Yeah. In fact, there's a today on Film Week. Uh, I'm doing Film Week today as well. Uh, today on Film Week, we're talking about a Chinese film called Mojin. Dude, I swear, so help me, they've jumped the shark uh, <laughs> again in the Chinese film industry. This thing makes no sense whatsoever. Uh, Mojin. We'll be talking about it on this show, I'm sure, uh, and when sure. it comes out on uh, on Blu-ray. Anyway, uh, Witch Hunter Robin, the complete series, centers around Robin Cena. And uh, this is all about... Um, it's it's less about like traditional witches and more kind of like uh, Men in Blackish, and we got a new Men in Black film coming, coming up soon yeah. too. So th- this is a little bit in that scene. So these, you know, she, she's got a partner, and uh, they uh, it, it gets into the you know the supernatural kind of spy genre in some degree. And then we have Akino's Journey, the animated series, the Beautiful World. Um, this kind of falls into the um, the travel log uh, genre of anime, um, journeying around the world and uh, you know visiting different places and having various adventures, you know, a few days in each place and whatnot. Um, really, a, a, a kind of an interesting um, interesting story and saga. Um, it involves a talking motorcycle. Mm-hmm. Which is kind of weird and a little bit speed buggy, but that's okay. Uh, so you know, speed buggy. A, a little. <laughs> you remember speed buggy? Oh man, you just you know, total I'm flashback sorry. right then. <laughs> oh, that's all I remember from speed buggy. Um, real quickly, Black Clover season one part two. We talked about Black Clover some a while ago. This is uh, you know the uh, everything it, things continue with the Wizard King and uh, the hero Asta, who's very much in the Joseph Campbell mold. And, um, you know, it goes on to the uh, – it's, it's very Lord of the Rings, the Diamond Kingdom and all this stuff. It's actually kind of fun, Black Clover. I think they're doing a live-action thing of that. Oh, really? Angel Links, the complete series. Uh, a little bit less excited about this. Uh, this is, uh, you know, uh, all uh, kind of space – um, it, it, it what's better? It's space swashbuckling. Oh, okay. You know, as opposed, as opposed to space opera. Yeah, space swashbuckling is what it is. Pirates and uh, you know, sixteen-year-old Mei Fan Lee, who's uh, you know, a bit of a bit of a a, a, a firecracker of a hero. Uh, we also have a Twin Star Exorcists, which is uh, really, really interestingly drawn. Very interesting anime. Uh, the um. It's a it's an epic kind of a hero battle, but it's uh, it's very dark. I wouldn't recommend this for kids. I'm much more excited about the next two Star Blazers, Space Battleship Yamato twenty one ninety nine Part Two. This continues the new Star Blazers saga, uh, the Yamato and uh, doing its uh, now fighting the Gamelins and Lord Dessler, and, uh, you know, they're trying to get to Iskandar, which was, of course, the destination of the original um, uh, the original um, uh, place where humanity has to go and uh, and save themselves. 
Uh, so I really, really like this new version of Star Blazers. I, I still love the original, but they're doing a great job with this new one, and uh, it honors the original in a beautiful way. And I like the live action, too. If you've never seen the live action Space Battleship Yamato uh, Japanese film from a few years ago, pretty cool. Uh, Code Realize, Guardian of Rebirth, the complete series. Uh, again, this is uh, one of those supernatural things that lives in a universe that it will make no sense for anybody that hasn't really caught up with this thing from the very, very beginning. So go and Wikipedia code realize, that's code uh, 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 colon realize, and get boned up on it, and uh, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll realize it's a pretty elaborate universe. Uh, it's a little noirish. Um, a little bit kind of, uh, uh, how would I put it? Victorian, it's like Victorian mm. noir anime, maybe is a better way to put it. Anyway, it's pretty cool. Pretty cool. Um, let's see what else we've got here. We've got, uh, King's Game, the complete series. This is a high school thing. Um, kind of high school supernatural, uh, and, uh, gets a little bit, um, it's a little bit gruesome. It kind of it's a, it's in some ways uh, one of these, and we're talking about this on the radio today too as well. Um, the it, it, the escape room is one of these, oh, yeah. that, right? Escape room is, and I won't say too much here, but it's it's one of these, you know, like Agatha Christie's, and then there were none crossed with the game, crossed with Saw, <laughs> all that stuff. You know, let's put human beings in a sadistic situation yeah. and, and see what 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 they're made of. So uh, anyway, that's a little bit what King's Game is like, except as a Japanese anime high school thing. Uh, a sister's all you need. The complete series. I love these titles. So bizarre. Uh, this one is just one of those straight up domestic comedy things, and I don't really get it. But if you like the the anime, you know, here here are some funny people, and let's laugh at them. And and why did we animate this? I don't know. Uh, Garo Vanishing Line Part One is part of the the whole Garo saga, and uh, you really need to bone up on that again too. If you if you know, it's there's all kinds again. There's like dangers lurking in. Uh, Russell City and all kinds of evil is is coming to the fore, and you know now we need to we need to you know get on board and do the Joseph Campbell thing and uh, realize our uh, our destiny. Um, real life final arc continuation of the real life experiment uh, between Arata and Chizuru. If you haven't seen the the beginning of it, you need to do that. This is just a, a completion of their. Their, um, their relationship and their experiment. Uh, Tales of the Abyss takes place in, a, in another world where, um, where they're, oh boy, this is a hard one to, to, to describe. It's a, it's a fantasy adventure, but it, it's all kind of oriented around a very weird uh, brand of magic that has some very specific and unusual rules and these things called phonic stones. Um, it's, it's worth watching if you, if you like that kind of stuff, but it, it, it does take a little bit of getting into, uh, Blood Blockade, Battlefront and Beyond, uh, is a, you know, more fantasy stuff, uh, you know, a, a crime fighting organization, uh, called Libra, which is trying to take down the, uh, the King of Despair, and it's, uh, you know, it's, it, it's basically Luke against Darth, but it's, mm. it's all right. Mm. And we got the uh, the Monster Hunter stories, uh, Monster Hunter stories ride on season one part four. I don't really get any of this stuff. This is like higher level Pokemon. Yeah. If you, but you know what? Uh, knock yourselves out if you like it. Uh, it's it, it's it's okay. It just it's it's really the same. It's just a, it's a higher level Pokemon. And then uh, Nanbaka uh, part two. If you didn't see part one, you're going to be completely lost. It's a little extreme. It's a little bit too much on the uh, on the razor's edge of um, mm. oh, what's uh, what's that one that I really really hate? The guy with the hair. Oh, who? The the the, the Dragon Ball guy. Oh, Dragon Ball. Yeah, a, yeah. This is uh, this is a little bit too much on the uh, on the like the punky Dragon Ball edge. <coughs> mm. Excuse me. Um, it takes place in, um, in a prison, you know, and it's all kind of, it's like, it's like if they dropped everybody from Dragon Ball into a prison. That's the only way I can describe this. Um, anybody, anyway, I, I'm not hugely a fan of this, but, uh, some people are, so go for it. Nanbaka part two. And, uh, let's see, want to make a quick mention also, uh, I'll save some of this anime for next week. Well, but... Uh, I want to make mention of uh, th three really, really interesting titles from um, uh, 
the right stuff. Well, actually, two from the right stuff. Let me get to the stuff. The two from the right stuff. One more from Funimation. But the two from right stuff. Mobile Gundam. Uh, mobile. Mobile. Huh, I'm gonna do this. Uh, Gundam Mobile Fighter G, Volume One and Volume Two. Um, Mobile Fighter G. This is part of the uh, endless Gundam universe. And uh, this all takes place now in uh, Century 60 and uh, centers around a Gundam fight tournament. Gundam. And I'm going to – normally I would say bone up on your Gundam, but you kind of don't. This is very, very self-contained. And it's actually really, really inter- interesting. It's, uh, it's, it reminded me of – did you ever see the old martial arts films, Kill or Be Killed and oh, yeah. Kill and Kill Again? Oh, yeah. With James Ryan, the, uh, the, the New Zealand um, gymnast who became kind of a martial arts yeah. thing for a moment or two. Yeah, about the early so, 90s. Uh, yeah. yeah, something like that. Mm. It's uh, I want to say eighties. Oh, the eighties, mid yeah. more mid eighties. Okay. Anyway, um, actually, really, really kind of fun. Actually, um, those movies have not aged terribly well, but this <laughs> yeah. is this is a little bit uh, in that kind of vein, except with with in with Gundam stuff. You know, with the whole uh, with the suits and the uh, and the all the, the the gear and the weapons, and it's actually really a lot of fun. I'm surprised they haven't done this before. Um. You know, better than Transformers, that's for sure. So uh, you get uh, 24 episodes on uh, episodes 1 through 24 on Volume 1, and then 25 through 49 on Volume 2. And there are even uh, some commercials on here and uh, and a lot of fun stuff. So uh, this is some of the better Gundam stuff that I've seen in a long time because it uh, it manages to be so self-contained and is not so completely immersed in the Gundam universe that you need to reference a lot of other stuff. So uh, that's Mobile Mobile Fighter G, Volumes 1 and 2. Uh, from uh, the right from right stuff, and uh, you want to actually go and get that at the right stuff um, site, and the right stuff site is uh, rightstuffanime.com, and that's stuff with one f. Rightstuffanime.com, one f. Uh, go there and uh, and check that stuff out. That's the best place to go. Tim, let's go into new movies. Let's do some new movies. Yep. All righty. Some of this stuff uh, is actually pretty daggum new. Yeah. Uh, in, including some stuff that we were considering. Oh, uh, you man. know, some of the some of the some of the stuff. Weeks. That one right there that you have White in your Boy hands Rick. was supposed to be an award contender. And yeah, it did that's not. why I was thinking about some of these. Uh, you know, how yeah. they did not seem to quite make the cut. White Boy out. Rick, of course. Uh, Matthew McConaughey. True story. True story. Uh, and, and a kid named Richie Merritt. Uh, this was you know this kid. This kid's uh, uh, Richie Merritt saw the debuting film. He's playing. He's playing the the uh, titular character, White Boy Rick. Uh, Matthew McConaughey plays his father. True story of this kid who became a police informant back in the eighties. Yep. Uh, you know, blue collar kind of family. Uh, then he became a dealer, and 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 then the cops kind of abandoned him. And, and anyway, it was, it was a, they, it, he ends up going to prison for a really really long time. But it's just a remarkable sort of Detroit crack academic story of when that when crack hit Detroit and everything just yeah. went bananas and uh, and 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 the drug took over everything. The cops are kind of crooked, the uh, and and so is everybody else. But you know, this movie did not seem to catch on the way they thought it might. I I have a th- my feeling is the movie was too grungy. Yeah. It was too grungy. Not that anybody wants that story. 80, 80, 80, uh, Detroit in the eighties. No, I mean not that you can take a, a that milieu and make it look glamorous. Mm. But there is a way of making it uh, making it sufficiently palatable for an audience. Mm. Because you're walking and you're watching a movie, you don't want somebody to spit in your face. Yeah, yeah. And this kind of is a little bit too down and dirty, too grungy. And I kept thinking, okay, what are what are some? Well, okay, you know, Ridley Scott, an American gangster. Mm-hmm. That had Denzel Washington. That yeah. had grit. Hus- uh, 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 um, hustle. Yeah. Uh, the yeah. one with, um, yeah. Um, yeah, you know. Exactly. Yeah. And and I, there's a way of giving it a little bit of a cinematic sheen without sort of uh, glamorizing it, without uh, without taking away, you know, the, the the necessary grit in the story. This just was too much. It was really unpleasant to watch. Yeah, Piper Laurie and uh, Bruce Dern show up in the film. Hey, to me, the problem was uh, no likable characters. At that, the end that, of the day, what we're supposed to do is identify with this kid. Yeah. But you know what? I don't like this guy. Put his ass in prison. He's okay with me. Yeah, I got no problem with him at all. Uh, go ahead. Uh, no, I was going to hit some uh, some 4Ks here. Well, but, uh, I'll, I'll knock out a couple of these. Ride yeah. uh, Bella Thorne had a good real had a good run uh, this past year. Yeah. This was another one that was on the list that we took a look at. Uh, Jesse T. Usher, interesting sort of shape. Will Brill in the movie, uh, a guy driving for an actor, driving for a ride sharing service, picks up this beautiful 
uh, 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 a young woman uh, hangs out with her, hooks up with another friend who's uh, you know a little loose, lo- a little looser than he is, and they go on a one of those sort of wild nights where this guy simply uh, has a sort of twisted sort of idea of what fun is, and they have to figure out how they're going to su- survive this knucklehead. It's kind of in- it's kind of fun in that way, old school kind of way. Uh, the only special feature is an original short film. So good performances here though. Bella Thorne and Jesse T. Usher, good good work. Alpha. I rather enjoyed this quite a bit. Uh, yeah. Throwback to the sort of Jack London, uh, well, novels and eventually movies of uh, back in the day. One uh, of the Hughes that, brothers did this, didn't yeah, they? Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, Albert. Uh, and it's just a neat, neat sort of story. Why uh, aren't they doing movies together anymore? You know, I don't know. I don't. Although, you know, maybe they just want to go their own. They, they didn't. They yeah. didn't want a Cohen brother up. You know. Yeah. Uh, uh, one of those kind of things. I, I want. I have my own sort of set of ideas. Yeah. Um, so this is a movie set during the Ice Age. Young man goes out hunting with the with the with the Alpha tribe. Yeah. Uh, he gets injured, and you know, as, as it happens back in the day, is left for dead. He survives. Hooks up with a wolf, a lone wolf, also abandoned by its pack, and he yep. and this wolf. Forge their way. And I got to tell you, this was moving. Again, Jack London, all those Ethan Hawke movies to get at that White Fang and all of that. Yep. We're, we're right there with this. It's really a lovely movie. It was not a movie that we were talking about much this year in terms of um, award stuff. I think that's not really fair because this is pretty cool. And anyway, this includes the director's cut and the original theatrical version. Nice. Uh, as well as several other special features. So check that out if you can. Slender Man. So the story of the Slender Man popped up. I don't know a couple of. I guess it's been around a really, that was really long creepy. time. It's uh, very creepy. A, and, and those girls, yeah, who oh. actually in, engaged in, 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 in. So anyway, these people uh, took that little actual news item about this character that became an internet meme called the Slender Man, which actually led to some fairly tragic things happening. They took that uh, and and devised this little story, which I suppose is sort of. I don't know, Blair Witch-esque or something like that. Uh, basically, it's a small town in Massachusetts. You have these friends. They do this ritual uh, because they want to actually debunk the lore of the Slender Man. But then one of them goes missing. And the question is, did they actually invoke the Slender Man and, uh, and get one of themselves killed? It's, you know, it's, uh, it's a creepy story in real life. I don't know if th- this movie is as creepy as what actually happened. That thing you got there next is, uh, is bananas. Obama land, rise of the <laughs> Trump, the Trump publicans. Is that what it says? That is that is a bananas, low budget, really bad, but kind of entertainingly bad. Remotely movie. entertaining, but it's Remotely. so badly written. They sent a. I forgot to bring it, but they sent us one of those caps. Oh, really? Thank you. Uh, make America not great again is what it says <laughs> with, the, with the, red, the red cap with the thing in there. Uh, he's a Muslim. He's a Kenyan. He's back. So the the, the idea it's is so that uh, President Trump is mysteriously killed by falling off of Trump Tower. Or something. I don't know what the hell it is. <laughs> like that. And Obama, and Obama uh, uh, comes back and declares himself president for life. And here we are 40 years later. Yeah. Uh, in a, in a, and there's a revolution in the making with the Trump public. To try, to, try to bring him it's, down. It's uh, crazy. Yeah, you know, because we live, we live in a, gu- a gunless, godless America renamed Obama land. It's just bizarre. It's nuts. And it's actually not very good. <laughs> it's just silly. <laughs> yeah. There, yeah, it's this silly. Is, this is one of those re- uh, uh, re- revenge, uh, the, uh, the, the, the attack killer tomatoes kind yeah. of things, yeah. right? Where you just sort of laugh it off and you just go, you can't, you can't. bravo for just going out there and letting it all hang out. It's yeah. terrible, but. You know, you have no shame, and yeah, there's a, yeah, yeah, the, that, that's the thing. Politics comes stupid. Yeah. I rather enjoy the Equalizer too. Denzel's follow up to the Equalizer. It's not like the Equal Equalizer. It's, it's better it's, than it's the better Equalizer. It's better than the yeah, uh, which, is, which was which was sort of you know interesting to me. Um, uh, same guy playing the same guy. He's living yeah. in this apartment complex. Uh, a couple of interesting things are going on. Uh, Melissa Leo, who plays yeah. his sort of handler sort of person, uh, is investigating a crime. Something happens to her. This sets him off. Meanwhile. There's a young black boy who has uh, moved into that building where he lives, and he has this whole relationship yeah. with this kid who's painting this this uh, this uh, uh, a mural on the wall, and that's the most interesting part of this movie. Yeah, it is. Uh, he becomes the surrogate father to this kid, uh, but because he is juxtaposed to Denzel Washington, who is this guy, yeah, uh, you know things happen. The thing that I like about this movie, all the way through this movie, Denzel Washington tells everyone he has to confront exactly why 
and how he's going to kill them. <laughs> he, mo- he wants to make sure that they, right. they, they, they know why. Yep. You, know, you know what you did. Yep. <laughs> you did it. You know you did it. Yep. Now I'm going to have to kill you. This is how I'm going to kill you. Yeah. And, and that's the guy that Robert McCall is. I'm not killing anybody. These people are basically killing themselves. True. <laughs> but they're yep. using me to do it. Uh, and that's what I like about this movie, uh, The Equalizer 2. A lot of fun there. Assassination Nation. This was sort of like the purge. I mean, it, yeah. you know, it's not. It's not the greatest movie in the world, but I kind of like the girl power thing that's going on. It, they, they put the, the guns in the girls' hands. It it had a it had a bit of a thing that helped you get over the hurdle of how derivative and kind yeah. of exploitative. A little it was. bit of Mean Girls, a little yeah. bit of the purge, but you know, yeah. Uh, but it's not. You know, the politics aren't all that goofy. And hey, hot chicks with guns. I'm okay with that. <laughs> I just don't have any problem with that. I'm sorry. That was good. that was good when I was 14. Yeah. Uh, and Even still better, is better now. <laughs> Monster Party. I don't know. This was this was sort of weird too. Not particularly good either. These um, uh, people posing as caterers at this big fancy mansion out in Malibu are really thieves. They're going to case the place and rob the place. What they don't know is that all of the people at the party at the mansion are sort of quote unquote recovering serial killers. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, and one of them just Ooh. can't stop himself. <laughs> so anyway, yeah. you end up with one of those. Uh, not a lot of on this. They should have probably popped a few special. Features on this and it made it a little bit more fun. Uh, Robin Tunney is in it though, and I always adore me some Robin Tunney. Yeah, for sure. Can't go wrong with her. Um, Ken, mm, I don't know. Uh, this this was this was okay. Dennis Quaid pops up in this thing, um, and this is from the producers of Arrival and Stranger Things. That's interesting. I yeah. missed the, I missed this one. Well, you know, I, it, it's it's a it's a it's, it's a little kid. Um, yeah, he, um, he this guy recently gets released from prison. He's gonna go back and hang out with his little adopted brother. Uh, and they go on the run with this kind of crazy criminal behind them, played by James Franco of all people, because James Franco could possibly be yeah. in any movie at any time. You just never know. Yeah. You just never know. You're watching a movie, and there's James Franco. Anyway, um, Eli, this little black kid, is destined to become sort of a hero. This has a pretty good cast in it, man. I mean, you got uh, you got Zoe Kravitz in this thing. Yeah. Who's in the uh, uh, the uh, Road Warriors movie not too yeah. long ago and all that kind of stuff. I don't know, but it just didn't seem to catch on, which is a little bit disappointing. Kin. The bummer. Yeah. Not everything works out. The last two I'm going to knock off kind of go together, which is why I held them out yeah. uh, for one another. The one is mid-90s, written and directed by Jonah Hill, uh, about more or less his semi-autobiographical experiences as a sort yep. of punk skateboard kid in the mid-90s. Which I never would have thought of him. Yeah, you know, because <laughs> frankly, you know, big kid for a skateboard. Yeah. Uh, but nevertheless, that's that period I know, I, you know, this is yeah. all post-me. Yeah. But I remember watching these kids. Me, I remember would have been mid-70s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For, yeah, for us. Um, uh, and I remember, I remember watching these kids all over LA in the, in, in the '90s. I remember yeah. them uh, in those swimming pools out there, driving the cops crazy in all those abandoned houses, and they would skateboard through the swimming pools. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I remember those Larry Clark movies, which Larry Clark made movies that were more or less about these kids. Yeah. And I, I will give Jonah this: these kids are all obnoxious, uh, sexist. Yeah. Ever so slightly racist sometimes, yeah. and he put all that in this movie. They're not evil kids, no, and they have a great affection for each other. But as human beings in the world, they weren't the best humans no. in the world, and I and I appreciate it. I appreciate that he knew that. He didn't pull his punches. He didn't pull his punches it's, about who they were. It's not the greatest movie. I would have. I, I had hoped that his his you know directing debut would have been a little bit more a- ambitious. Um, I thought it might have been an awards contender. It, it turned out and not there you to go. be. There, there, but yeah. but it's uh, it, it's worth watching. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's worth watching. Yeah, it's, a, a, I appreciate a, a, it. It captures a moment, yeah. that's for sure. Interesting to me that the last movie I'm going to talk about with this group, Skate Kitchen, a film by Crystal Mosel, is the exact same film in reverse. Uh, it's about girl yeah. skateboarders. And you got this young you, this young girl. She's living in New York, and she... Uh, she stumbles into these group of other girls who skateboard, and they get together and they form this friendship. And they, it's 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 a really deep culture kind of thing. Exactly what's going on in mid nineties, except yeah. for these women, young women, because yeah. they are in fact girls, yeah. aren't mean, uh-huh. aren't nasty, aren't particularly sexist yeah. or homophobic or racist. And it really is just about how they've all got each. Now they're obnoxious, mm-hmm. you know, but but they're not they, they're not they're not obnoxious in a, in a way. They're obnoxious in a way of where they're claiming their individual yep. individuality. Yeah, they're just claiming their rights as human beings because they've been sort of pushed down as girls and all that kind of stuff. Yep. they're claiming their own rights. They're not attacking anybody else. Right. Really interesting the way basically the same movie 
explores these two cultures and finds completely different things. They look like they're the same, but they're not. Uh, and uh, soon we are going to hopefully get the documentary, um, The United Skates. Ah, yes. Which we talked about on Film Week uh, not long ago, which is not skateboarding, which is uh, about roller skating and the role of the roller skate rink yeah. as kind of a center of urban urban culture. Well, that was a big part of my life, you know, yeah. Not in, mine. In, in black cultures, yeah. That's well, funny. And that's what it's about. And it's urban, a great, yeah. great doc. So I'm looking forward to talking about that here because we talked about that on Film Week. It was one of my favorite films of the year. It yeah. made, my, made my second 10 for those who've gone online and at, uh, at uh, cinegods.com and seen my silly top 10. Uh, and uh, here we now we're going to get into some 4K. We got a 4K giveaway. Giving away two copies of Mission Impossible Fallout on 4K, courtesy of Paramount. Thank you, Paramount. Mm -hmm. Go ahead and send us, we talked about that end of last year. Go ahead and send us a, uh, an email with your name and address to gods at digigods.com or gods at cinegods.com. Uh, name and address in the body of the email, and just put Fallout in the uh, subject line, F-A-L-L-O-U-T, one word, Fallout. And um, by the time the uh, the uh, 13th rolls around, we are going to close this contest. So make sure your emails get to us date stamped by January 13th. Uh, and other 4Ks this week, 25th anniversary of Schindler's List. Yeah. Can you believe it's wow. been 25 years? I remember the screening the night we went to the screening. I do too. <laughs> it's, it's also, you know, wow. I you do know. too. Me, you, uh, 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 Bridget, uh, it's a whole thing. Yeah, I, it was crazy. And, and you know, I was going to, I remember I was going to bring my mother to the screening. My mother, of course, being a, a World uh. War II refugee. And, um, you know, because I, I, I'd taken her to see Hope and Glory mm -hmm. years earlier in 1987. And uh, which she enjoyed because that was sort of the British version of her childhood experience. Mm -hmm. You know, yay, air raids, we don't have to go to school, that kind of thing, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, by the time Schindler's List rolled around, that was pushing different buttons. Yeah. And I remember her very well saying, uh, thank you, but no thanks. I've seen enough killing in my life. Yeah, yeah, it was an interesting thing. I, that, I re that hit me hard. I, I was, it was an interesting thing. That movie obviously moved me quite deeply, as it yeah. did everyone. But I remember thinking to myself at the time, have have we have we have we covered this? Is are we can is are, are yeah. we done now? Uh, because it seems to me we have to come around a corner. That's twenty five years ago. Yeah. Plainly, I was wrong. Yeah. Uh, and I, you know, but it's interesting the way these things sort of come to you at that particular moment in history. I thought I thought okay, I think we got it. Well, I mean, you look back on this, and uh, it's it's really an amazing cast. Still, I, you know, Ray Fiennes yeah. was was a newcomer at the time. Ben Kingsley was not. Uh, Liam Neeson was not, but he, no one had seen him yeah. do this before. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, what? It, but it still it holds up, man. It really, really does hold up. I have a few issues with it, but man, over time, I I just don't even want to go there. Uh, the movie has really improved with time, and it has some wonderful special features on the Blu-ray. The 4K version of this is just not to, not to be believed. It's to die for. It is uh, just the best black and white I've ever seen. And it retains the grain of the film, and it's beautiful. But they have a 25 Years Later uh, documentary, which is great. They have a feature-length doc uh, called Voices from the List, which is all mm. actual Holocaust survivors and their testimonies <laughs> that is just so deeply moving. And um, and there's more than that. You know, it's just, it's great. You, it, you, it, if you don't have this, you don't, you don't love movies. It, it's, a, it's a funny thing. And the, the little movie that I made, I allude to a great many movies because of, you know, why, why the hell shouldn't I? Of course. Uh, and one of the big allusions is to that red Coat. That, that red coat. Yeah. yeah. I remember. Yeah, I know that. Yeah. I, I know that. I've read the script. Uh, we have a couple of uh, just beautiful IMAX uh, movies that have been transferred uh, to 4K. And it's not like IMAX in your living room, but it's pretty close. Uh, Journey to the South Pacific and A Beautiful Planet. Uh, one of them's in orbit and one of them's in the oceans. Uh, I, I have to say, I think Journey to the South Pacific is the best because I love the South Pacific. I've never actually been dying to go. Uh, will go one day, but man, does this make it just look beyond beautiful. Mm. It is absolutely fantastic. Underwater, uh, the reefs, the sea life, everything. It's just, it's gorgeous beyond belief and unbelievably well photographed. Go soon, because in, in, it, it, in years, <laughs> a lot of that's going to be actually underwater. Yeah. yeah. Uh, beautiful Planet is uh, is also great. Narrated by Jennifer Lawrence. This, uh, you know, looks at the Earth from orbit and uh, uses you know photography from the space station, from the uh, the Hubble. I mean, it's it's just really really amazing, and you realize how extraordinary this planet is, and how fragile, mm. and and kind of how you know it literally is a, a grain of sand in the yeah. universe. Talking about Kevin Hart, Night School. Yeah. 
uh, with Tiffany Haddish. And uh, boy, did that New Year's Eve thing of hers was really unfortunate. Oh, you know, yeah. That's, yeah. You know. Hey, I, I saw her talking about it. And, uh, and uh, you know, she talked about how all comedians have a bad night. Yeah, but you don't want it to be on New Year's Eve. No. You know, that that's, was that's not a. That's but not. I still love her. Oh, she's, yeah, still great. she's funny. She's funny in that movie. She's great in this movie. Kevin Hart is great in this movie. <laughs> Tiffany Haddish is taller than Kevin Hart. That's the thing that I love. Um, not not on the not in the artwork, but uh, he's he's hiding in a locker there. No, I think Night School is actually a really really funny movie. It's funnier than you might imagine, and uh, it, it's 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 it, it's just two great comic talents and uh, really really killing it. They don't they don't make comedies like this anymore. This also includes an extended cut, not yeah. just theatrical cut, extended cut which is basically the same yeah i don't know what the difference is jokes are a little longer that's all, uh, yeah. that's all. but uh what a, what a, what a great couple of comedy talents that was a lot of fun um also on 4k is the new halloween i don't know what the point of this is i know a lot of other people really really like this uh dave gordon green the man mm. who made george washington is now yeah. making a remake of halloween i don't understand it i don't understand it i don't but i don't understand his whole why career he made the, i don't understand his, those dumb comedies your, your highness, highness and I, I, just, I, yeah, I, don't know. I don't get it if I you've never seen george washington though uh, which is a, a deeply moving sort of existential yeah. exploration of a young boy these these young children <laughs> Uh, which is, I, which yeah, is an amazing that. debut. Yeah, you know, beautiful in every possible way. And then he made one or two other decent dramas, Snowbirds. I seem to remember. But then he just goes just left with all these, with all of this other stuff. Some weird. of which were big hits. Yeah. So you know, true. There you go. Just got weird. Uh, and then uh, we also, oh, we, we have an interview by the way that we're going to have at the end of the show. We have an interview. Mm. You're going to, you're all going to be very excited. It ties into a documentary that we're going to talk about. But stay tuned. Just stay tuned. Um, Hellfest. Is out on uh, on 4K. I'm not at all sure why. Uh, the <laughs> seriously, you know. So the so we had Bloodfest, which was another film that came out a few weeks earlier. Let me let me distinguish them for you. Bloodfest is about a bunch of kids who go to a carnival that's supposed to be hee 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 like referential about horror films, mm. and then of course something happens and all the all the things actually do kill you. Everything there really kills you. Yeah. Hellfest is totally different. <laughs> Hellfest is totally different. This is about a bunch of kids who go to a carnival <laughs> celebrating Halloween, and there's one serial killer who's oh. actually there. Oh. So in one, it's the whole carnival that starts killing you. Yeah. In this one, it's the one actual serial, serial killer. killer. Yeah. I want to yeah. underline, these two movies are totally different, <laughs> and they are nothing at all alike. Um, uh, you know what? People get killed. It's just, it's, it just is what it is. Um, it's just the nature of fest. <laughs> it's just so you have stupid. a fest, somebody's gonna get killed. It's just so stupid. Um, let's go into some catalog titles real quickly. Um, TwilightTimeMovies.com. That's where you go for your Twilight Time fix. And uh, Twilight Time over the last few weeks has released a lot of great stuff. A lot of really great stuff. Uh, Satan never sleeps. Uh, is a uh, is a really really un kind of a lost film in many respects. Uh, uh, it, 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 this is a Leo McCary movie from 1962, the last film that Leo McCary ever uh, directed, and uh, a really unsung uh, lost performance by William Holden in it, along with Clifton Webb, who are um, a couple of uh, a couple of American priests. In China during the revolution, while in taking place in 1949, when you know communism is sweeping China and the uh, the Chinese Republic is falling, and um, there's a there's a, a bit of a silly um, uh, there's a, a bit of a silly uh, romance in this thing that reminds me a little bit too much of Love Is a Many Splendored Thing. However, William Holden is more appealing than Humphrey Bogart is in that. Mm. And instead of uh, uh, having a white actress play Asian, they actually have France Nguyen mm -hmm. play the part. So that I appreciated because France Nguyen was great on Star Trek, if anybody ever saw that in Elon of Troy. Oh, my gosh. She was great. Fantastic. But uh, anyway, the uh, that's a little bit silly. But nonetheless, it's um, considering that it's based on a really bad novel by Pearl S. Buck, it makes for a pretty good film, and that's mainly because of Leo McCary. Mm. Also from Twilight Time, Anne of the Thousand Days, which is an absolutely great movie. This is uh, uh, from 1969, one of the last great movies of the 60s. Um, Irene Pappas, of all people, is, is in this, but it's really Jean-Jacques Jean Bujold who plays, uh, who, who plays Anne. Uh, is just absolutely wonderful. Uh, Richard Burton plays King Henry VIII. Uh, Jean-Vierre Bujold is Anne Boleyn. 
and uh, Charles Jarrett directs the daylights out of this thing. It's a really, really terrific period film. Not as good, obviously, as um, A Man for All Seasons, which was the Henry VIII movie of a few years earlier with Robert Shaw playing Henry VIII. But boy, this is a really, really great movie. Really fun. Two and a half hours. Just a great period film produced by the great Hal Wallace. Really terrific. Um, another movie that gets kind of falls between the cracks a little bit is A Man Called Peter, yeah. uh, which was made in 1955 based on the Catherine Marshall 1951 book um, about uh, her husband, P- uh, Peter Marshall, who was a, a kind of a, a legendary preacher at the time. And um, it's, it's a very interesting movie about faith. They don't make major studio films about faith figures like this anymore. And this is probably the last really significant one that they did make, uh, at least about a religious figure that's not taken from Scripture or something like that. Uh, Really worth checking out. If you've never heard of Peter Marshall, he's a really important figure, and uh, this is a really, really interesting movie about it. Um, Richard Todd stars, along with Gene Peters and and Marjorie Rambo. It's a really, really good film, and uh, kind of, you know, directed by Henry Coster. Fell between the cracks and kind of fell off the... uh, off the radar a lot. Antony and Cleopatra with Charlton Heston and Hildegard Neal. Um, I oh, I want to like this more. Uh, Heston directed this himself mm. uh, in 1972, uh, kind of capitalizing on his second career renaissance when mm. he was making all those sci-fi films. You know, yeah. there was the Chuck Heston of the of the Ben Hur era yeah. and the Ten Commandments era, and then he kind of aged a little bit, and then he came back grizzled yeah, making yeah. Planet of the Apes and Soylent Green yeah, and yeah, Omega yeah. Man and yeah. he got a little cachet again and decided he was going to make this and it I really wish this were a better film uh, this includes a, uh, a little making of thing with uh, his son Fraser Heston on it as well as an audio commentary with Lee Pfeiffer and Paul Scrabo who are film historians um, more interesting for the commentary than the actual film I would say uh, Oklahoma Crude not a terribly good movie, but a really fantastic cast. George C. Scott, Faye Dunaway, John Mills, Jack Palance, uh, all do really fantastic work. Directed by Stanley Kramer with his usual total lack of subtlety. This is like Stanley Kramer saw Giant and said, that's eh, a little too subdued. We need to turn that up to 15. <laughs> yeah. And that's what he did. Um, but it's, it, you know, it's nicely <sighs> shot, and it's got some yeah. great Henry Mancini music. And, and really, like all Stanley Kramer movies, it has a message. It does indeed. Yeah. Uh, and then we've got uh, Black Widow, which, of course, is, uh, is, is kind of a cool hip noir from uh, 1954. It's... Uh, it, it, written and directed by Nunnally Johnson, who's one of the all-time legendary screenwriters, um, it, it, but it's it's kind of um, it's kind of a, a gentle noir in some respects. Um, but Gene Tierney is fantastic, and Ginger Rogers is great. Uh, Van Heflin, it's just a, it's a really really fun cast. I it, not as dark as it probably should be, um, but it's you know uh, it, it's got some it's got some rough edges that are that are fun. And then last on the uh, Twilight Time list here is a short night of glass dolls which is a compl- I, I never would have expected anybody to resurrect this i barely even remember this um aldo lotto italian director mm. uh made this in 1971 and the only thing that i remember about this at the time was um uh, that it just had an unbelievable cast of beautiful women in it. Mm. Uh, one of whom was Ingrid Thulin, who is just absolutely incredibly beautiful. That's pretty much all I remember about it. It's a murder mystery. It's kind of an obscure film that uh, that sort of it, it fell in the at the end of a, a, a giallo moment. Um, it, it'll I, it's kind of an interesting thriller. I think some people will probably enjoy it, but it really is a bit of an obscure one. The only significant thing about it, and what is nice here, is it has an isolated music track for the Ennio Morricone score, which I do not believe is available on a CD or uh, download. So it mm. may be the only way that you can get the score. So that is a short night of glass dolls. Wow, Tim, hit us uh, with the arrow stuff. Uh, a couple of quickies here. The first one is uh, Bloody Birthday, nineteen eighty one movie by a director named Ed Hunt. This is a Okay, little movie is about these girls who were born uh, at the height of some sort of eclipse with the moon and the, the Saturn was blocked, blah, blah, blah. Ten years later, they're crazy as hell, killing everybody. Um, that's all okay. More interesting is that Ed, 
Ed started making movies back in the late 60s and sort of hung on for a long time. Knocked out a movie in 2014, which I remember talking about on our radio show, uh, a Dracula movie with uh, Eric Roberts. No so, you know, kidding. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, Ed hung in there for a long time. More interesting is the uh, it's Willie Dynamite, 1974, black ex- you know, height of the black exploitation I love cinema this movie. period. A lot of people think of this uh, as, as the best of the black ex- exploitation it's, films it, of the it's period. A, it's top ten for sure. Uh, so you know, because you got your shafts and your superflies and your blah yeah. blah blah and all that kind of stuff. Most interesting thing about this, Roscoe Orman. Roscoe Orman, who plays Willie Dynamite, the, the, the pimpiest pimp of all pimps. He's the pimpiest pimp. Purple and gold cat lab. It is everything. I mean, it is it is a it's just not to be believed. The style, I can't even imagine how they pieced all the the the, the cost, the car, the cost, everything. Hey, the, the thing the of this in 1974, you could buy that stuff uh, pretty much anywhere. But it, but <laughs> but it is a it is a look that goes above and beyond. Oh, it well, really does. It he just out, is. He out pimps young priest from Superfly. Yes, yeah, so a big far. Time. Um, also in this movie, uh, the, the late Diana Sands, uh, yeah. who was an extraordinary actress who I love to talk about all the time because she was one who she died young at age 36, but so her sad. career was going to be amazing. She would have been a Diana Carroll. Uh, yeah. She was that good. Thelma's Rasula. Uh, Roscoe, were you, were, were you all out there uh, know Roscoe from? You know him from Sesame Street. Oh, uh, that's right. That's Roscoe. Roscoe uh, spent most of the rest of his career after playing the pimpiest pimp of all pimps on Sesame Streets, singing songs and dancing little dances with no with, with Groucho and all of those guys. That's Roscoe. He's the brother with the mustache, the bald brother. And you probably know him more as a middle-aged man. Yeah. Check him out when he was young in 1974 no playing kidding. Willie Dynamite, Roscoe Orman. I oh. had totally forgotten about oh, that. That's Roscoe, yep. Fantastic. Crazy. <laughs> oh, good stuff. Uh, Warner Archive has three Blu-rays worth mentioning. One is The Thing from Another World, which is the Howard Hawks film uh, with James Arness playing the kind of frankenstein looking guy with the brow that was eventually remade into the uh, John Carpenter movie, ah, The Thing. Yes. Now in the John Carpenter movie, it's this weird thing that turns into Friends, other things, yes, and it yes. just—it's not—it's not James Arness in a, in, a, in makeup. Yeah, it's not just a single. It's—it's yeah. it's a whole different deal. But uh, there is something to be said for this. Uh, now, now Howard Hawks produced this, did not direct it. It's a Howard Hawks production. He he got it made. It's directed by Christian Nyby, who made a few other things. Has some really really good music by uh, De, by um, Dmitri. Tiomkin, mm. great composer. Um, but for the most part, it's a, it's a studio-produced B-movie exploitation film, which comes with a certain amount of cred, and that cred being uh, that it, Howard Hawks produced it and Charles Lederer wrote it. And um, it's a, it, you know, it, it goes in, in there with the sci-fi films of this era. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is 1951, which all, even though they're a little dated, they, they do represent a certain sci-fi paranoia of the nuclear age. Yeah. We're afraid of Russians. We're yeah, afraid of we'll, atomic yeah. war. We're yeah. afraid of fill in the blank. The Chinese are up and coming. So it's a whole new paranoia. And the movies dovetailed from World War II patriotism in the 40s to mm-hmm. all this, this kind of surrogate sci-fi paranoia in the mm-hmm. 50s. And invasion of the body snatchers. Invasion cetera, of the body so snatchers, yeah. yeah. You know, uh, uh, this island Earth. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's, you know, there's a lot of that. So uh, it, in that sense, it's part of that corpus, and it's very, very interesting. Uh, Horror of Dracula, Christopher Lee and Peter Cushing. We've had a lot of these 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 uh, wow. uh, Hammer films in the last few weeks. Uh, this is on uh, on Blu-ray. It's just another one of those Hammer Dracula movies with Christopher Lee. They're all kind of the same. They all look the same. Christopher Lee really brings the same performance to all of them. Yeah, and it's good enough. Uh, in the, you know, I, I don't really know what the point is to making so many of these, but um, you know, it was a moment. It was a moment. Yeah. Uh, the one I also really, really want to make mention of, this has been on DVD for a long time, never on Blu-ray, Errol Flynn in The Seahawk. Uh, they were going to try to remake this, I think, for, for a minute. Uh, one, of, one of Flynn's better swashbucklers, directed by Michael Curtiz, uh, right, before, right before he made Casablanca. Mm-hmm. And uh, has some amazing uh, Wolfgang, Eric Wolfgang Korngold music in it, just as many of the Flynn movies do, like Robin Hood, yep. Adventures of Robin Hood. And uh, this also had a screenplay co-written by Howard Koch, whose son, uh, otherwise known as Hawk Koch, Mm -hmm. oddly enough, Seahawk, Hawk Koch, uh, was uh, head of the Academy a couple of times in the the 90s. So um, some great special features on here, including a uh, Warner Night at the Movies, 1940, hosted by our friend Leonard Malton, and then some newsreels and a Porky Pig uh, animated short. And then there's also a featurette on uh, on uh, Errol Flynn and Seahawk. It's a really fun swashbuckler. It's definitely worth checking out. All about Captain Jeffrey Thorpe and uh, all of his uh, his his adventures around the time of the Spanish Armada. Really, mm. really fun film. Good stuff. 
And then uh, we got some great ones on Criterion. Tim, look what we got. Oh, the Magnificent Ambersons. At uh, long last. Yeah, uh, that, that underrated or, or, or Orson Welles film. You know, it was so taken forth. away yeah. from him. Yeah, it was taken away from him. And and, and and but and and even that was still a good movie. Yeah. You know, but anyway, yeah. Yeah. So uh, Criterion has given us a, a great trio this month. Uh, the Magnificent Ambersons from 1942, the follow-up to uh, Citizen Kane, uh, which is truly still one of uh, Orson Welles' very, very best films. This is a, Because this is effectively kind of a semi-lost film, mm. the, the extras here are so, so important. Uh, there's a Dick Cavett show on here from 1970 with Orson Welles. There are uh, video essays. Um, there is There are two different audio commentaries, which are so, so interesting. Uh, new in- uh, video interviews with Simon Callow, the actor, who has tons to say on this, and Joseph McBride, mm-hmm. who, of course, we know as well. He was in our documentary, film Schlock. Historian. Mm-hmm. Great film historian, Joe is. Uh, there's, there's a 1978 AFI symposium on Orson Welles, which is here only in audio format. Um, uh, interviews with Peter Bogdanovich talking to Orson Welles. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of stuff here. It is really, really, really interesting. And uh, you'll learn so much about Orson Welles and the film uh, just with this. This is as good as the film has ever looked. I'm thrilled about this. Interesting that, that, that that's coming out uh, because the other side of the win, of course, is one that we were talking uh, on about. On Netflix right his, now. His last film, yeah. quote unquote, uh, that Netflix got restored. You, uh, Peter Bogdanovich. Uh, uh, yep. So Orson, yeah. Yeah. And then the other two here from Criterion are uh, totally unexpected. Uh, one is an Abbas Karastami film called 24 Frames. A little bit avant-garde. Uh, actually, more than avant-garde. It's uh, More than he, more avant-garde than he usually is. Yes. Well, it's, uh, what, he, what he's trying to do is create the moments that happen before and after a photograph. And so he takes 24 different images... And then he um, does this kind of uh, animation. He animates these vignettes for each one. It's. Uh, I remember Mark saw this at uh, at Cannes mm. and uh, hated it absolutely with a passion. <laughs> uh, so uh, it, you know, it's a lot of people were not enormously thrilled about this, but nonetheless, uh, it, it has a certain cachet. And he recently left us. Abbas Karastami did. So in terms of Iranian cinema, it's a little bit uh, more on the on the fringe, but it's worth checking out, and it gets a great Criterion treatment. And then the last Criterion is 1986's True Stories, uh, which was a, uh, a, a one of those, when David Byrne had his little moment uh, doing some things with movies, uh, he went and made a, made this utterly weird kind yeah. of, uh, it's just, it's this very strange look at middle America, you know. Uh, in the middle 80s. In the middle 80s, uh, you know. A way John of- Goodman. Way of looking at America in, in just through his own weird eyes, uh, you know. I, it's a little bit like if Albert Brooks had a looser screw, mm. he would have turned uh, uh, American Romance into this. Yeah. So anyway, but it really is a it's a it's a fascinating film directed by David Byrne, starring David Byrne, and uh, it's 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 weird. Kind of a road movie. He wanders around. Co-written, by the way, with uh, Stephen Tobolowsky. Yeah. Who's the actor? The actor Stephen Tobolowsky. Ned. <laughs> okay. Ned Ryerson. Ned Ryerson. <laughs> Groundhog Day, folks. That's what he will forever be known as. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's go on with the Mill Creek Rewind Collection, which are, which all have those cool VHS things making a, making their Blu-rays look like old VHS. Yeah. Tapes. Tim, hit it. What it's we got there? A, it's, a, it's a lot of fun because it looks like it looks like they're just barely pulling the VHS out. And what's <laughs> terrible? I worked at one of these stores. Yeah, uh, and you know, with the VHS, yeah. I worked at a few of these stores, and yeah, this is giving me all kinds of horrible flashbacks right now. <laughs> Terrible store managers, whatnot. Uh, who, uh, who's Harry Crum? John Candy, the late great John Candy, yeah. who we lost quite a while ago now. John Candy was an extraordinary guy. Plays a plays a, a sort of soft hearted uh, private detective. Uh, in, in this thing, Jeffrey Jones and, uh, and Barry Corman and Annie Potts, the wonderful Annie Potts, and it's funny as hell. Uh, I had a crush on Annie Potts like you would need. The interesting thing about, about John Candy, yeah. big guy, yeah, um, who actually pulled off several times playing the main love entrance. Yeah, right. Of, of, uh, the, the leading That's man true. love interest. Yeah. And they would put these hot chicks uh, opposite him, sometimes playing his wife or some girl or wh- whoever it is that he's yeah. going to do it. And you'd always buy it. 
It's true. You'd buy it. Uh, you you summer rental or whatever it is. You, yeah. I buy that. I buy it because he had this sort of odd charm. He did. And thing. Yeah. Uh, what did he own? He owned some sort of Canadian sports team. Uh, oh, he remember. did, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, a, yeah, yeah. Like like a, like a, like a D League hockey team, team or yeah, something. something like that. Yeah. Anyway, um, all around great guy. Never met him myself. Yeah, I didn't but either. I remember this movie, and it was r- ridiculously funny. What's the set again? This is from the... Oh, this is the Rewind, the Mill Creek Rewind Collection. The Mill Creek Rewind Collection. Man, yeah. these are these are really giving me hard bodies. Uh, <laughs> I remember that this was, this, was, this, this was the movie that was, it was rated R at the time, and it was all these girls in these bikinis. <laughs> anyway, a couple of middle-aged guys uh, move into a beach house. Uh, they, they hire some young dude to sort of hang out with them and teach them how to stud it up. Uh, and it's just hot chicks and bikinis. This is, this is one of the movies that made me want to move west. Yeah, you know? I hear you. Uh, yeah, back in the day. In that moment, in that, uh, yeah, that Tom Cruise, what was the uh, getting, getting some? Yo, getting some. Yeah, whatever it was. And, uh, yeah. uh, some, oh, you Joystick. Just, there's so many of them, so yeah. many of them. Uh, the Sure Thing, yeah. Rob Reiner's second film. Yeah. Uh, Chuck Nor- Norris, Silent Rage. Man, oh this movie gosh. here. I'll tell, you, I'll tell you something about this movie. This is a really, really good movie. I got movie. a story about that movie. You have a story about I this movie? I got a story. Uh, when, when me and the wife went to see this movie, yeah. First of all, we love this movie. Uh-huh. Uh, this movie, despite it's a sci-fi movie about uh, there's some wacky doctors doing this uh, experiment on, on this uh, uh, corpse, and they turn him into this guy, and he's running yeah. around this little town, Chuck Norris, with this big, fat, goofy deputy, and, <laughs> and bodies dropping <laughs> everywhere, and all this kind of, and Chuck has to go after this guy, and he keeps killing this guy, but he just won't die. Because he's got the serum from the mad scientist. Yeah, and, and you know, and it's the simplest thing in the world, but... Damn it! Don't, it just works. It's, so, so I saw this uh, at the time. I was part of this club. It was like the Columbia Preview Club or something. So, whenever they needed to get a focus group on a movie ahead of time to know how it might test, yeah. The, then I get my little thing in the mail. Hey, come on down to the, <laughs> the mail. Here. Hey, come on down for a screening at the Columbia Preview Club, and we get you know free swag and stuff. And you go in, and and it was always on the Warner lot. I don't know why there were Columbia movies. Mm. I think it was, but they were always on the Warner lot anyway. So go over there, and I remember very well. We were sitting in that screening room in what is it, Building Thirty Eight or yeah. whatever? You know, the, you know the one over yeah. off of uh, uh, on that one side. And um, uh, we go, we go in and we sit there. And and I brought several friends who were also, you know, we could each bring a guest. And then some of my friends were members of the club as well. So I think there were maybe four or five of us. And um, it, it didn't start well. Uh, some of us sat closer to the screen than the others, and there were these jokes going on ahead of time, like you know. Uh, ooh, I was looking at the left side of the screen. I missed that, <laughs> right? We were, you know, we were just being dumb teenagers. And and when the movie came on, we were thrilled because it was a Chuck Norris movie. We were Chuck fans. We we're like, yeah, like the Octagon. And then suddenly, this guy who looks like Mick Jagger gets an injection of serum and becomes Superman, and he won't <laughs> die. And Chuck's, you know, dragging him behind. He's shooting him with a shotgun and dragging him behind trucks and all the rest of this. And uh, the guy just keeps coming. It, and it just, on, it, honestly, it was about halfway through the movie. Everyone in the theater, probably about 40 or 50 people in this screening room, everybody's talking at the screen, making jokes. Uh-oh, who's around the corner? <laughs> it just, it went completely off the rails. The thing is, we all like the movie. We all, it, it, it's completely <laughs> insane. Yeah. Uh, but you, you can't. And then it has that great last scene. Uh, and, and, yeah. and, and, and the movie's pretty pretty old, folks. So, I, so I'm sorry if I'm going to blow this for you. Yeah. Where the dude comes up and he throws it down the well, the well. <laughs> and that and that, that's great freeze frame. Yeah. And I, I'm thinking to myself, well, that sequel, fabulous, never sequel. happened, never happened. Yeah. Never happened. And I just don't get it. By the way, they've been running this thing on television, uh, 1982 film. They've yeah. been running this thing on television about every 20 minutes. Yeah. For the last couple of weeks. So every time, <laughs> I, you, I, in my apartment, I have like 15 televisions uh, on at all times. It's too funny. So about every 20 minutes, I run into one of those. Happy birthday to me. Uh, I remember this one too from way back yeah, in the I day, 1981 film, <laughs> uh, horror movie. Um, uh, look, uh, this is this this is uh, the best of this particular genre. This is yeah. okay. It's not you know, there were a lot better ones than this uh, that were made. But you know, uh, birf- birthday girl. She she has an accident. She, she suffers from these blackouts, and the question is, uh, is she going to become the next killer or something like that? I don't know. Whatever. It's okay. Not one of the best. Um, these last two, crawl. I particularly wanted to save uh, this and the next one because, yeah. <laughs> for one thing, I absolutely loved crawl. 
Peter Yates directed this Peter and, the, Yates and the dresser in the same year. Yeah, yeah. So it, weird. Uh, but there w- that it was a period where space, not or space or futuristic sort of operas yeah. were happening. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, hey, you know, I mean, uh, Sean Connery made that weird one where he wore the big red diaper. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, 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 Zardoz. Zardoz and yeah. all that kind of stuff. So this one, uh, uh, mystical time and place, all it's, kinds of creatures. It's very much in the Star Wars pocket in the Lord of the Rings pocket. It's yeah. that whole thing. And and look, I mean, it, uh, it's kind of goofy, but it, it's, it, it, it's, it, it's, it's it's still it's fun sustained. to watch. It's still fun to watch, and, and it has a great James Horner score, and yep. I don't often say those words together. Yep, 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 yep. And it's, this is pre-CGI. Yes. It has a lot of blue screen, green screen stuff going on here, lots of makeup effects. Cyclops. Cyclops with that big yeah. one eye and all that kind of stuff, and some swords and some sorcerers, and I just, dude, sometimes I prefer it to yeah. uh, give, me, give me this over the Lord of the Rings. Um, 1993, Arnold Schwarzenegger, the last action hero. Now this movie, this movie was this, this movie was a big flop. Love this movie, but I love it now. I, I'm cheating. I love it. My wife's in it. Yeah. So I love it because my wife's in it. <laughs> uh, but I love it anyway. And this movie has some of the funniest dialogue. Just just one liners that are absolutely hysterical. And it's really wise because it's Schwarzenegger ref- and John McTiernan, yes, John McTiernan reflecting on this genre in a very kind of philosophical way from all the way back in 1993. Yeah. Uh, uh, Charles Dance in this movie, fantastic. It takes uh, and it t- is basically it's, Quinn. It's basically an action film version of Sherlock Jr., the old uh, Buster Keaton film. Yeah, and with a little bit from Purple Rose of Cairo and all that. You know, the the last action hero junket was one of the funniest things I ever attended. I was at, <laughs> I was at that press day with my friend Bruce Kirkland, who's mm. a film critic in Canada and a very very good film critic. And Bruce, you know, was a junkie guy. I mean, he 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 he'd been on the junkets forever. For you know, everybody knew him. And Schwartz and Bruce, being a Canadian. Dresses like a Canadian, so he had <laughs> he had some vest on that had kind of like native native Canadian uh, uh, oh, yeah, t- t- the, the designs patterns, on yeah. it, patterns on it, right? So you know he owns he owns being a Canadian, and and Schwarzenegger walks in, and he and the first thing he does is he walks up to Bruce, whom he's met before, and puts his hand out as if he's going to shake his hand, goes right past his hand. To the vest and starts feeling starts feeling the fabric and he says that's a very nice curtain you're wearing do do they make it for men too and it's just brutal. it was brutal but you know what everyone laughed it bruce laughed funny. it was arnold it was being funny. arnold yeah. and he owned the room uh, yeah arnold in 1991 i will tell you this my wife told me that Arnold Schwarzenegger, because she had a scene with Arnold, that sometimes yeah. is, it, it, when, when they play this play the movie in, uh, you know, different versions, because yeah. different cuts, sometimes it's in the movie, sometimes it's not in the movie. Because uh, she's playing a hooker in the movie because all black actresses had to play hookers. <laughs> at that time. <laughs> at that particular yeah. time. She couldn't play anything else. She had a great scene with Arnold. Uh, and, and, she, and she told me that, you know, she used to hang out with Arnold and Arnold's uh, trainer. Yeah. And, and there was a whole little group of them, and she said that Arnold was always just a perfect gentleman, just yeah. absolutely fantastic. I see so, that. so that there, there you go, Arnold. My wife says so. So we uh, we have an interview we're going to wrap the show out with. I want to hit a couple of docs, and then one of them will dovetail us into that interview. Uh, the first one is Love Gilda, uh, beautiful, beautiful Magnolia doc about Gilda Radner, tribute to Gilda Radner, and of course Gene Wilder. Uh, and uh, really, that, that's all there is to it, man. Uh, if you don't know who Gilda Radner was yeah. or why you should care, one of the original uh, Not Ready for Primetime SNL players, uh, just a beautiful human being. A yeah. funny woman, but funny a beautiful human being. Associated and with Gene Wilder. And if you, when, you, when you look at um, Amy Poehler, yeah. um, in, any of the ladies. They would Saturday not Night exist Live, without, but for her. Without, but, but for Gilda Radner. Lots she, of important ladies. That's it. Uh, but they are the offspring of Gilda Radner. She paved the way. Uh, from Kino Lorber, a great documentary called Iranian Cinema Before and After the Revolution. I am a huge fan of the Iranian New Wave, but uh, there's so much here that I did not know. And uh, it's a really, really, really great documentary. Um, this, is, uh, it, this is a two-disc set. And it's 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 basically th- it's a three part documentary or three independent documentaries. Uh, Jamshida Krami made uh, the three different films that are made different periods of time, but they really do form one overarching look at the uh, Iranian film industry. And it's just it's absolutely superb. So Iranian cinema before and after the revolution. Uh, the three parts here is Friendly Persuasion, The Lost Cinema, and The Cinema of Discontent from 2013, which gets into much more recent stuff, uh, and, and it's 
really, it's just so good and, and so much information there. Um, and then uh, also have In the Land of Pomegranates, which is oh, yes. a, a wonderful doc from First Run Features about the uh, Israeli-Palestinian affair through the eyes of Palestinian and Israeli teenagers, which gives you, like many of these films, a really dualistic look. You, you kind of have some hope for the future, but you also realize it's a really tall hill to climb. Mm. But the, uh, the, the, the looking at it through the eyes of this generation as opposed to their parents' or their grandparents' generation yeah. is, is very different, and they see the future in a very different way. Uh, Resistance at Tool Lake, uh, by Conrad Otterer is a story I had no idea about. I never knew this happened. Uh, this is about, this takes place, uh, this is a Japanese internment camp oh. a documentary, but it is specifically about uh, 12,000 who were interned at uh, Tool Lake Segregation Center uh, who resisted their internment. Mm. I had no idea that ever happened. It's like It was like, like the slave revolts of the, the 17th and 18th century. It was that, that level of Astounding. resistance. And it's really extraordinary, and some great extras on here as well, including an interview with the director. Um, it, it really is, uh, it's just a, if you, I mean, it teaches you everything you need to know about that period and more. And then lastly, terrific documentary called United We Fan, The Fans That Shape TV History. Uh, this, this goes back to an era that we don't really remember anymore because of social media and because TV is so fragmented, but it used to be that shows would get canceled which was a routine thing, mm -hmm. and, and then suddenly fans revolted. Mm -hmm. And you had grassroots letter-writing campaigns mm -hmm. that would save or resurrect or kind of... Uh, keep, keep, keep it alive. Keep it alive. They almost killed Cheers. It's true, and it's it's really uh, this is a wonderful doc. It, it it interviews the you know the fans, the stars, everybody who had any kind of uh, any any investment in this, and crucial part of this story, B. Joe and John Trimble. If you don't know the name Trimble, you are not a Star Trek fan. <laughs> uh, B. Joe Trimble and her husband are, are sort of the original grassroots of Star Trek fans, part of the original letter-writing campaign to save Star Trek. And B. Joe uh, would go on to write some of the, the, the greatest Star Trek fan books ever, including the uh, Star Trek Concordance, which I have proudly on my shelf, first edition to this day. Mm -hmm. So... Um, I had a chance to talk to B. Joe and John and to talk about Star Trek and fandom and all of these related things. And it was a real thrill for me because I've just, you know, since I was a kid, I've had B. Joe Trimble books on my shelf. Mm. And uh, so this was a wonderful chance to kind of revisit that and to talk to two really, really wonderful people. So here I'm so, I'm so, I'm so glad they include a quantum leap right on the right yeah yes yeah. yeah my wife was in one of those too. Fantastic. I love it, man. So without further ado, here is B. Joe and John Trimble. Thank you both for speaking uh, with me this morning. So uh, I'll, I'll get right to it. Um, first of all, your, your books have had a treasured place on my bookshelf for I don't know how many decades. I don't want to make you feel old because it's going to make me feel old, but ever since I was a kid. So thank you for, for, for that, for so many wonderful opportunities to just be a part of the, of the fan scene. Um, talk about this movie and how you guys got involved in it. Okay, which movie? Oh, are you United We Fan. United, United We Fan. Okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, you know. <clears throat> um, I'll tell you what. I'm going to move into the other room because I can hear her talking, and then the delay, I can hear, you know. So, uh, yeah, go ahead. So, le so let me just ask okay. again. So, so uh, speaking today with with John and B. Joe Trimble, who are who've just been a huge part of uh, of my life for decades. Amazing books, just a wonderful, wonderful presence, and especially in the Star Trek fan scene. Talk about how you guys got involved in the movie United We Fan. Well, um, gosh, you know, I I have to tell you, I don't remember how we got introduced to Michael Sparga, but we did. <laughs> Um, it, you know, he contacted us. Um, yeah, but who, oh, all right. Then so, so somebody gave him our name and, and number and said, you know, uh, but anyway, yeah. And he, he presented the idea, uh, of, of they'd originally wanted to aim specifically for a, a, um, uh, television series. With you know that that featured fans, but not in a in a in a snarky way, and uh, which would actually be a change, wouldn't it? And uh, yeah. uh, we uh, uh, you know so we were interested, and he they brought up two okay. specifically. Yeah, he, 
and one, said, one was toys, and the yeah. other was uh, how we how we got uh, things done. So they came down to L.A. Uh, he and his uh, uh, crew, uh, and uh, wanted to film us. Uh, you know, and it kind of interview us, film us. Uh, in various locations, our house, of course, we're sitting in front of a bookcase with a Nautilus on top of it, um, and uh, at a restaurant called Jake's, which Michael just absolutely fell in love with, <laughs> loves their barbecue sauce, and uh, there's some opening scenes in the thing where we're walking into WonderCon, which is sort of the the miniature version of Comic Con, San Diego Comic Con that's held in LA or in the LA area. Uh, so, you know, and they were absolutely amazed at how we knew all those people. Mm-hmm. You know, the the subject of the film is is so interesting because it's it you know, we for, I think people forget that as powerful as the the letter writing campaign to save Star Trek was originally it was unsuccessful. Uh, the show was still canceled, and uh, it was, well, but it was the beginning of something else. It, it, it sort of, I mean, that was the first, wasn't it? Wasn't that the first time that there was really, uh, people sensed that there was a, a surge of fan support for, for something outside of the world of just regular television viewers? Well, but yeah, I, and I, I would not, I would say it was not unsuccessful. It, the, the, Campaign got the show a third season. Okay. If it hadn't had a third season, by the standards of the 60s, it would not have gone into syndication. So because it had a third season, it went into syndication and has never been out of syndication since then. (laughs) That's a great point. Yeah. You know. What what made you know what makes uh, what made Star Trek special in terms of the fan support relative to other shows and did that mark a turning point? Do you think for that that has sort of brought us to where we are today? Yes, uh, on uh, all of the, yes to all of the above. Uh, for one thing, Star Trek was offering uh, mature science fiction. Not yeet, there's another alien, let's kill it. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, which that was, uh, used in many of the other television, uh, series. And that was a whole, you know, a carryover from the, um, uh, uh, old 1950s movies, you know, right. uh, and, and it uh, was Star Trek was the first adult, uh, series science fiction on on television there would have been some you know the previous the shows that had been uh you know uh, done for adults rather than kids yeah. were uh anthology shows uh twilight zone uh there were a couple of others that were done uh but they were one offs you know that were done all through. This was the first time that anybody had done a a continuing series with a, with the same cast of characters um, as in an adult way, and it really grabbed us. The the. Uh, the discuss- I know, you know, from people that I've spoken to um, who remember the executive ranks at the studios and the, and the networks back then, the the idea that people could be so attached to a TV show that they would that they would engage in in letter writing and and lobbying was something that really caught a lot of them by surprise. They the the conventional wisdom up until Star Trek was. Well, you win some, you lose some, and the show's canceled, and you you know you shed a tear yeah. and just and just and carry on and and they 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 didn't realize that uh, anything could so be, could could become such a central part of someone's life outside of just passing the time on a on a on an on an evening and i I would argue that that's really when 
the Spielberg Lucas era began, that we wouldn't have gotten to Jaws or Star Wars or Close Encounters or E.T. without the understanding that there is that there is this kind of a fan base. Would you agree with that? I I think I would. Yeah. Yeah, to a degree. Um, I think that there were all, were always uh, uh, you know scary stories like. Uh, um, uh, Jaws or something, but um, and there were certainly the old horror things, but there was not a, a fan base that revealed itself. Now, there was a huge fan base for, like, the horror movies and so on, but there, they they just discussed it, be, you know, among, amongst themselves. There was never any reason for them to speak up about it, and um, <clears throat> so it was really kind of a of a novelty to uh, uh to have people show such interest to show be so intense about it and i don't think it was um the uh it was expected at all and um you know bless their heart um uh the the powers that be were um not at all prepared for the the loud clamoring uh, from fans. Yeah, and of course we the, we surprised the empty suits is what we did. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, that was about it. So, uh, but uh, you know, we we never thought about it like that. We knew that there had not been, if there had been any any former. Um, uh, you know, uh, efforts like this, that it was really just a, um, uh, <clears throat> pardon me, uh, was, it was um, not something that um, had made much of a splash. Looking, so if there is anybody out there who did it before we did, I, I don't want to denigrate them for sure. So, uh, Looking looking back on it, is there anything that uh, that you that you think could have been done differently, should have been done differently? Um, you know, this is almost like political organizing for for the arts yeah. in a way. Um, and it was, you know, you're you're sort of inventing it uh, as you go along. Were uh, how you know if you were to do it all over again, would you do it the same way? Well, no, not today, because <laughs> we're talking 50 years ago, yeah. and there were no uh, personal computers unless you were terribly rich. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, things were, were just very, very different. Um, we were we were mailing everything. We were hand, um, well, hand addressing. Well, we, were, we were doing it on mimeograph yeah. uh, and uh, mailing everything out and, you know, Asking people to write letters and ask, copy the information and send it to ten friends and have them write letters and have them do the same thing. So that, and you don't have to do it that way these days. But is there is there something about the ease of you know it, what you're talking about is effort and when you know during those days you, that, that represents an effort on the part of the fans and today anybody can create a you know a change.org. Uh, poll and it just it seems like it's very easy to get and there's so many polls and so much there's so much activity today is it easy to take it for granted do you think that the way that was done at the time with the letter writing campaign that that, that the the amount of effort that clearly required made it special made it stand out in ways that today it wouldn't well I, I guess so in a way but but Today, you know, don't uh, don't denigrate the people who do efforts now because, frankly, it takes very special people to get off their fat apathy and get something done. Good point. Good point. It really does. I mean, there. You know, I mean, let's face it. Uh, uh, you know, there ought to be something we could do about that. Okay, yeah. let's do. <laughs> Which is what I said to her. <laughs> But people don't want it, you know. They're they're perfectly willing. What they really mean is there ought to be something you guys could do about it. Yeah. But not me. And that's happening everywhere. It happens in politics, and that's as far as we're going to go on that subject. Yeah. And you know, happens everywhere where people want to stand back and um, let somebody else do it. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. I don't want to get involved, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, it doesn't even mean getting involved. They'd perfectly, be perfectly willing to get involved, for the most part, if they did not have to do anything about it. Yeah. If they didn't have to speak up, if they didn't have to uh, write letters, if they didn't have to do this. <laughs> and today, yes, it still takes writing letters because you have to go on that computer and you have, have to – now, granted, it's easier, but you have to go on this computer and uh, type up your contact letter – Give everybody some suggestions on how to write a letter but without copying you and that kind of thing. And then uh, uh, send it out and and then be ready. This is something that an awful lot of people don't plan on. And when it happens, they're sort of startled. And that is when the uh, when people start writing you and saying, you know, well, uh, uh, you know, what else do I do or what can I, you know. And you've got to start answering mail. Um, this is something that a lot of people aren't ready for, and um, it just yeah. You know, so, um, but but can it still be done? Oh yes. I mean, look at the people who uh, recently have um, not have have managed to speak up and and just blow the uh, the, the people away who are on the um, uh, you know on the show. And by the way, here's another thing that's changed. Back when we were doing it. Uh, we couldn't even let Gene Roddenberry play through, and that drove him crazy because all producers are, um, are, are uh, you know, uh, control freaks. And um, the star, the actors, were afraid to get involved because they felt it might be, um, uh, you know, detrimental to their career. Well, nowadays, evidently, they don't care because. Um, Many of the newer campaigns we were very pleased to see had uh, the people that were involved in the show, the people who acted in the show, uh, helping out and, and, you know, cheering them on. And, if, and you know, if nothing else, just cheer, being cheered on helps a little bit. I know it helps a whole lot. So anyway, it, that's one of the changes that we see now. Let me let me start to wrap up with this question. I know it's one you've been asked a million times before, so I will try to phrase it in a way that, that makes it a little bit fresh. Um, you know, Star Trek is the single most significant media phenomenon in American history. The only thing that comes close and that rivals it is Doctor Who across the pond. Um, it has been continuous from the, ni- the 1960s to the present, um, perhaps with a small blip there when it was uh, after it was canceled and before Star Trek the Motion Picture came out, when everyone was lobbying for it and there were conventions galore. In which case, it still isn't. It's more in the public consciousness than ever. It has it has not left us. It's proliferated. It's still on TV. There there are still movies. Um, it, it, it's remarkable the the penetration that Gene Roddenberry's creation had then has continued to have and does still have. Um, what, what is it, if you could distill that down in this incredibly convoluted media environment we have today where there's so much product and people can choose anything, it still has a place, a prominent place. What is it? What's the, what's the secret ingredient if there is one, or is there even a secret ingredient? Is it many ingredients? Many, many. Back when it first started, one of the things was it was it was basically a uh, substitute for family. This was the 1960s. Um, many youngsters felt very alienated from their fam- family. Um, they just uh, and and you know they needed something where there was a family. And this was interesting because in these those days there weren't so much. The uh, the groups, uh, if they were, if there was a, 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 a group of actors in, in one show, there weren't so many of them that were uh, were family. They liked each other. And and, the, and, well, at least the cast weren't family in that sense, re- being related. They all interacted in the same way that a family would interact. And a lot of the shows that were on where there was a family – they were always putting down one member of the family. You know, the bumbling husband, the uh, the flighty uh, uh, housewife, you know, whatever. Uh, and while well, there was a little interaction between, say, McCoy and Spock on Star Trek, it was all in, in good humor and in, in obviously 
a loving relationship. Um, and that was a, that was an important uh, point that is often overlooked by people who look at the at the show and try to figure things out. It was this warmth and this this uh, ease of interaction between the characters. I think that's one of the things that makes Star Trek IV: The Voyage Home such a popular one with fans is because you had that interaction again between the characters in the same way that they're similar to the way it was on the TV show. And uh, it's tremendously appealing for that. Do you believe there is something that, uh, and and I'll I'll, I'll lead you on this question, Um, I am always frustrated by the fact that even though we're allegedly in the quote-unquote golden era of television, seems to me that uh, the lessons that you just outlined have still not been learned by the majority of people who are out there spending now tens of millions of dollars making television shows. They still haven't learned the, the ingredients. The, they, don't, they don't understand the secret sauce all these decades later. Would you, would you agree with that? Definitely. Yeah. I, I sometimes want to, want to, if I had the money, take out a huge ad in whatever it is producers and directors read and say, there are a billion good science fiction stories out there. For heaven's sake, don't keep copying everything else. (laughs) But uh, it doesn't, you know, I don't don't know if that would help me at all anyway. Well, uh, every little bit helps. And uh, it's it's just so great to, to have this movie out there, to have you guys out there still carrying the torch. I cannot thank you enough. And um, thank you for speaking with us, and best of luck with everything. Well, oh, thank you very much. Thanks so much. Take care. Bye. Bye. Okay. Bye-bye.